Poverty, especially childhood poverty, is a public health issue, and we will explain why this morning on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. In the current issue of Madison Magazine, my wife Nancy Christie and I reported on the prevalence of hunger in food-rich Madison and Dane County. Food insecurity is pervasive and it has a profound impact on families, especially children. Food insecurity is of course tied inextricably to poverty, an issue we as a nation have talked about in terms of politics, social implications, race, culture and gender and many others. But there is a growing movement to consider poverty a public health issue. My guest this morning is at the forefront of that movement and Dr. Bernard Dreyer, Professor of Pediatrics at New York University joins me this morning as part of his visit to Madison. Dr. Dreyer, thank you very much for joining me. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Where, where, where do we start to rethink how we view uh, the effects of poverty on health? Well, I think the first thing uh, that we talk about, we meaning doctors, especially pediatricians concerned about childhood poverty, is that uh, poverty is a health issue that the definition of health is uh, not just medical illness, but it is also um, child development, uh, its well-being, and its ultimate productivity as an adult. That I always say that as a pediatrician, I take care of children, but my goal is to produce a healthy, productive adult. That's, that's what I think my job is as yeah. a pediatrician. The attention that this has gotten would expose us for neglecting to think about this as a health issue. Why, why have we not done that? Well, I think uh, there, it depends upon who you mean but we. I guess I, we, I, as a, I, we as a nation, you know. I, uh, I think that um, children don't vote. Right. Uh, young parents who have children often vote on other issues rather than on their children's issues. They think they can take care of those issues. And uh, the poor members of our society are somewhat disenfranchised from uh, being empowered to vote and to elect people who are going to take that issue on. Um, we as a country have, in fact, decided to take care of our seniors. Right. Um, and, I, you know, when I talk about childhood poverty, uh, remembering that children are the poorest group in our society. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're much poorer than seniors, and the reason seniors are not poor is that the government has programs to protect them, uh, namely Social Security and Medicare. Before Social Security and Medicare, uh, seniors were much poorer than children were, and um, so uh, for me that says that our government can do something about childhood poverty, but uh, has not chosen to take care of children as much as they've taken care of seniors. And I'm not pitting seniors against children, right. actually. I'm officially a senior, uh, and I appreciate the fact that the government wants to take care of me. But I think the question is, okay, we've done this for seniors, why not children? Um, I think most people, number one, are not even aware that so many children are poor in this country, although every time I talk about childhood poverty, that's one of the aha moments, like really, one in four to one in five children in our country are poor? And if you include near poverty, which is like that area just above being below the federal poverty level when children are still at great risk, um, it's almost one in, one in two children that is poor in this country. So we talk it, about these statistics a lot here in Madison having to do with the public schools, Dr. Yeah. Dreyer, and that's, and, and indeed there, the statistics are exactly, as you explained, if not worse, it, it is 50% or more of the kids in our public schools are, are poor. Right. So to focus on Madison specifically, Madison is a generally white, educated, yep. wealthy area, but the pockets of poverty are actually very poor. So if you compare uh, black children in um, Madison to white children, 75% of the black children are living in poverty, which is an, out, out, uh, an astounding number to think about. That's, that's more than two times uh, as much as the national level which certainly speaks to racial disparity, which is often how those numbers are, are portrayed, right. um, which well, probably complicates the poverty conversation. Right. It does, although most poor children, well, I shouldn't say most, but many white children are poor. So about a third of the children who are poor in this country are white. Uh, so w uh, poverty is really, it crosses 
racial lines. It's not just black children or Latino children that are poor, but um, a percentage of white, although fewer white children are poor per, uh, as far as a percentage of all white children, because more than half the children in the country are white, there are many poor white children as well. In fact, in the reporting that we did for the piece in the magazine, all of the families that we talked to were white families. Um, and these children uh, in, uh, dealing with food security on a regular basis, um, uh, a lot of people would, would not see that when they looked at that family in any, in any given circumstance. Uh, and yet it is far more per pervasive than a lot of people think. And, and the parents worry about the impact that has on those kids. Yeah, I mean, almost one half of children who are living in low-income families, which is beyond just poverty, in the United States uh, experience food insecurity. And um, people often ask, well, how does that jive with the fact that so many poor kids are obese? Right. It's a common question. Yep. And the answer is they are very directly related because if you are very poor, the only food you can afford to get is um, fast food, very calorie dense, not particularly healthy food, which at the same time will make you gain weight. And at the same time, in between that, you don't have enough food so that you're really feeling hungry. Yeah. Uh, Before we leave, uh, uh, you mentioned the, um, the difference between the elderly and the children, and I think, uh, I think I quote you correctly, the statistics prior to Social Security and Medicare, was it 80% of the, uh, of the senior population? Not that bad, 35% of I'm, seniors. Thank you, I'm sorry. 35% of seniors were poor and 27% of children were poor. Okay, and then that went and down. And uh, now only 9% nine. Right. of I, seniors I, are poor. Yep but 22% of children are poor. Yeah. So there is something wrong with that picture. If you look at young children, zero to five, it's 25%. And uh, when we get to talk about what the impact of poverty is on children, the, one of the major concerns we have is early brain development. So if you think of young children being the most vulnerable as far as their brain development, going through the most rapid skill development, and being even poorer than older children, even more food insecure than older children, um, you know, it, from my point of view, it's a national disgrace. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the impacts that you mentioned right after this. My guest this morning is Dr. Bernard Dreyer, who is past president of the American Pediatric Association and a professor of pediatrics at New York University. And Dr. Dreyer was in Madison this week. Uh, to talk to a whole bunch of people, including a public uh, conversation that was held on Thursday, uh, talked to the city council, met with doctors uh, about uh, childhood poverty and its relationship to health. And you were mentioning the impacts of poverty, and, and it, you talk about deprivation and stress um, uh, that is a, a result of poverty that are symptoms that we see in young people. How do they manifest themselves? Well, so I, I like to split it up into sort of three uh, different concerns. First, the direct effect on health. Uh, poor children have poorer health. Uh, they have more chronic disease. Uh, they have uh, more accidents with more mortality from those accidents. They have more asthma. Um, they, they are more likely to have low birth weight when they're born, which leads to a, a whole slew of problems. Uh, as we mentioned before, they're more likely to be obese. Uh, which leads to, again, a variety of complications. So we know that there are many direct health effects on poverty. But for me, uh, the effects on their well-being may be more consequential. Um, because, uh, and we, and, and the way this works is through uh, a variety of issues, but one is through uh, their brain development through what we call toxic stress in early infancy. Um, and what that means is that the stress of having um, parents themselves too stressed out to parent their children the way they need to be, um, lack of nutrition, um, uh, poor environments, uh, all of those things um, will, will affect the growing brain in the child. And they do, through, do that through hormones and also through what we now call epigenetics, which is um, turning on and off your genes. And we now know from science that those changes, uh, although some of them can be reversed, many of them are permanent. So that the actual structure of a poor child's brain is being 
changed and affected by living in a stressful poverty environment. And what that means is by the time kids get to school, they're already so far behind their non-poor children that they're there with right. that it's very difficult for them to catch up. And so, you know, they're on a pathway of intergenerational poverty, frequently not graduating high school, having low paid jobs, uh, you know, more adult crime, all the things that we know that, you know, you really have to start early to intervene. Um, and um, unfortunately, we actually, I should say fortunately, we actually know what programs work. We know that home visiting to help parents um, is very effective. We know that uh, high quality preschool and high quality childcare work. We know that programs in, in pediatric primary care like the Reach Out and Read program where doctors work with families and give them books so that parents read more to their children really helps. Um, we know that giving parents some extra money through programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit um, mm -hmm. and like making child, high quality child care affordable, we know all of those things we know from science will improve the child's outcome, will make that child be as good as any other child by the time they get to school. The problem is we're not doing those things. I shouldn't say we're not at all. We're not doing them up to scale. We're doing them on a small level, but we're not bringing it to scale for the large number of poor children in our country. Okay, um, we've talked about this for a long, long time now, uh, and, and uh, uh, early childhood and many of the programs that, that, you, that you have talked about. I, I appreciate that we're not doing it up to scale, that that's one challenge. But if indeed the family is not lifted out of poverty, can those interventions succeed? I think I always talk about a two-pronged approach. You have to lift families out of poverty. We have good evidence that being lifted out of poverty makes you a better parent. It's not that these parents don't love their kids or don't want to do it, but the stress of poverty, the lack of resources that they uh, can't provide to their kids, uh, makes it almost impossible for them to be the parents that they need to be. So yes, we need to lift people out of poverty and we can talk about some things we can do to do that. At the same time, I think most of the parents need the extra, uh, most of the kids' brains need the extra help of these programs to A, make their parents better parents, to, to support their parents in parenting their children, and then get them into the educational system with high quality education early in childhood so that they're ready to go to school when they're five or six years of age. So what can we do? Well, uh, a couple of things I talk about. One is that, you know, the United Kingdom in uh, 1999 decided to start a war on childhood poverty. Uh, Tony Blair started that and committed resources of the government over 10 years and dropped their childhood poverty rate from 26% to 10% uh, from 1999 to 2010. So um, the reason I mention that's, that... That's extraordinary. Right. The reason I mention that is uh, frequently people tell me, yeah, of course I'm against childhood poverty, but what can you do? You know, I mean, it's really, it's too big a problem. It is not too big a problem. If you look at what programs now work for families, uh, the earned income tax credit is very powerful. Uh, food stamps or SNAP uh, is very powerful. They are already lifting many children out of poverty. Um, other government programs like WIC, et cetera, do that. And then there are some problems that poor families have that we can take care of, such as child care. The cost of child care or the lack of child care, which means that parents can't go to work, uh, is a big problem for poor families. So providing high quality child care would lift many families out of poverty. Uh, in addition, uh, I know there's this battle now of, uh, uh, around the Affordable Care Act, but one of the drains on poor families is uninsured adults have many out-of-pocket expenses for their health in addition to not being healthy, and that's another cause of poverty. Uh, I estimate that if we actually provided high-quality child care and insured parents so they, could, they wouldn't have to pay out-of-pocket, we could lift another 5% of kids out of poverty. So that if we increase the earned income tax credit, if states pitched in as well as the federal government, uh, if we took care of child care and health insurance, uh, we could get that poverty rate down five or 10 points 
you know, pretty easily. It's not that it's an apology. That's what the British did. They, they, they figured out a package of tax credits, of benefits for parents. They raised their minimum wage to a point where it, if you work full time, you're not living in poverty. In the United States, if you work at minimum wage full time, your family is still going to be below the poverty level. So uh, they raised it so that wouldn't happen. We could do the same. Okay, we're going to talk about some of the barriers to that and what we can do when we come back right after this. I'm back with Dr. Bernard Dreyer, professor of pediatrics at New York University, who is here in Madison talking about poverty and childhood poverty as a public health issue, a growing um, uh, conversation nationally, uh, and uh, one that is just getting a, a, a great deal of attention. Now, you were talking about a lot of uh, issues, the earned, in, earned in income tax credit, food stamps. There are a lot of people right now in Washington who are very adept at framing those issues in ways completely counter to the public health discussion. How do we, how do we get at that dichotomy right well, now? Well, you know, the sad thing is that the earning of tax credit was a, sort of a Republican idea. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's supporting working people. You have to work to get it. So the concept of, uh, you know, the undeserving poor who doesn't work and just gets hands out, the earning tax credit actually promotes work and is supporting work by helping people who are working uh, but don't make a lot of money actually support their families. So there really should be bipartisan support for increasing that for families. Um, I can't answer the question as to why there isn't. Um, uh, uh, SNAPs, uh, SNAP or food stamps, I use the word food stamps because it means something yep, to Yeah, people don't know what SNAP uh, is yeah, yet. I, actually, there are no more stamps, there's cr little credit cards, so that's, uh, but um, as I said, it raises about 3% of kids are raised out of poverty because of that. And uh, a number of doctors have been taking the food stamp or SNAP challenge, trying to live on the amount that a family gets from food stamps for a week and seeing what it feels like. And what they say to me when they do that is that after the first day, they're hungry all the time. You get $1.50 a meal for three meals a day. That's what you get. So not exactly living high in the hog. Um, and uh, th and uh, they feel hungry all the time, and after a while, that's all they think about is what they're going to get for their next meal. They start feeling listless, moody, um, and that's for a week, and then they can go back to their regular lives. But poor kids uh, don't get out of that. That's what they feel like all the time. So can you imagine how they're functioning when they have to go to class, and they're hungry, and they're supposed to be concentrating on doing math? very hard to do. It really impacts, in addition to just being hungry all the time, it impacts the way they can think or focus on other things. Yeah. Um, it, it feels significant to have a pediatrician talking about this, and, and it feels like it would be powerful for more pediatricians to talk about it. What is the role of the, of the medical profession, yeah. the role of, of average citizens, and the role of our political leaders in, in changing this? So that's what this has been all about for those of us who are kind of leading this in pediatrics. Um, uh, pediatricians have known about this forever. We are on the front line. We see poor kids and the impact of poverty on a face-to-face, day-to-day basis. Uh, so we've always been involved with doing something about it. But actually standing up in unison uh, is what we've been starting to do now. And actually, I'm really proud to say that all the pediatric organizations have um, signed on to say, we're all going to speak together and say, this is a national shame and we have to do something about it. It started with the a a Academic Pediatric Association setting up a task force. I'm co-chair of that. But then the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is the big organization, 60,000 pediatricians, pretty much all pediatricians in the country belong to that. This past February made uh, poverty and child health, they're an extra strategic priority. And now, just uh, two days ago, I was on a conference call with the Pediatric uh, Policy Council, which represents pretty much every important pediatric organization. And they said, we will stand behind what the AAP and the AP are doing in childhood poverty, and we're signing on to this agenda. 
we have to speak out as a group. And what our hope is is that uh, if the nation's pediatricians uh, all together stand up and say this is not acceptable, not only do we know what to do about it, but we have to act on it, that perhaps we will have an impact on the political system. Yeah. And until then, I mean, I thought it was interesting that you spoke to the Madison City Council. Um, <clears throat> who, I don't know what kind of lifespan this current political environment is going to have, but it right. seems to me that right now there are things that we need to approach at the local level that really we can do as a city, as a community. You're, to absolutely, to you're absolutely right. A lot of poverty, although we focus federally too, big importance, Got to. but actually at the state and local level, when you take a, talk about child care, early childhood issues, uh, there's something called place-based initiatives, which is focusing on high concentrated poverty sure. neighborhoods and doing something about them. Those are really local issues. Local communities can do things about that. They can also, states can increase the earned income tax credit in their own state. Many states do, some states don't. New York City as a city actually has its own earned income tax credit. Mm. Madison should consider that. Yep. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of local things that can happen. In fact, much of the action is at the local uh, area. So I, 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 I think that if Madison or, or Wisconsin or any city or state um, takes this on, there's a lot they can do, irrespective of what's going on in Congress. And if maybe we just change our, our, our vocabulary so that when we talk about poverty, it isn't solely as a political issue, but as a public health issue. Yeah, I think most people are, are uh, people have said to me, everybody's sympathetic to a poor child. The problem is poor, child, poor children live in poor families, yeah. and they're not always sympathetic to poor families. Yeah. Dr. Gerard, thanks very much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure it. to be here. We're going to come ramp up for the record right after this. My thanks to Dr. Dreyer for being here this morning. Next week, for the record, we'll be preempted for a special one-hour town hall meeting on health care. We'll be back November 3rd. We'll see you then.